developed a really strong interest in Soviet and Russian affairs in high school and college, high school in California, college at, at Georgetown University, um, and began to read uh, a lot, studied Russian, studied old church Slavonic. Um, but of course, I was enamored with what, what was then being called medieval Russia. And so all my textbooks were about medieval Russia. And so I thought I wanted to study the Christianization of Russia. I want to understand how the world of Byzantium came north into this world of uh, East Slavs, Finnish tribes, of, of Viking freebooters, and how it influenced them and created this new culture, but as a prelude to Russian history. Um, however, I did my dissertation research at Dumbarton Oaks where I ran into Ihor Shepchenko, who uh, at that time was associate director at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, but also uh, uh, on the board of directors at Dumbarton Oaks. And he challenged me right away. Um, from a scholarly perspective, like what is this place Russia you're talking about? I don't, I don't think I, I know it, and so that sort of brought me up a little bit. And um, and eventually I went to Harvard, uh, and I did a couple, worked for a couple of years at at, at Hurry when uh, Obiang Pritsak was the director, and that was an incredibly vibrant time intellectually. You know, and what was amazing about those folks was that they were not nationalistic. In other words, they were not, it was not a political program. These were scholars who were doing what Hrushevsky said, which is study the sources and what other sources tell you. And what the sources told me about this place was not Russia and nothing to do with Russia, that this world that Byzantium entered was its own world. It should be studied on its own world. And it, that dovetailed completely because at that time I would do my uh, research with uh, my professor at Berkeley was um, uh, Peter Brown, who himself had, had created a field of late antiquity by saying we should study the third, fourth, and fifth centuries, not as the end of the Roman Empire, not as the beginning of the Dark Ages, but as its own field, one of the sources tell us. So when I got to Harvard and I began to read Hrushevsky for the first time and, study, and actually take Ukrainian for the first time, um, my world completely changed. I could never go back to this sort of antiquated, really Russian historiographical tradition. Uh, and, and from then on, you know, I was a Hrushevsky fan. Um, and um, in, in that sense, my scholarship has been informed by him since, you know, the mid 80s. Uh, the, the impact on the field, I think you have to go look at it in three periods. The first period is when he was actually active. He was extraordinarily influential in his time uh, because of his organizational prowess, because of his tremendous energies. He was able to almost you know, single-handedly, but obviously with a huge scholarly team, both his teachers and his, his colleagues and his students, to really vault uh, the studies of medieval Rus uh, to the first, you know, sort of top tier of, of, of scholarship uh, at the time. And so, you know, up until the, the, the revolution, um, he had an extraordinary impact. And he was he was succeeding in his ambition to sort of create a, a, an intelligible field of, of, of East Slavic history by saying, Medieval period need to be treated on its own, not as a, a you know, a, a first chapter of somebody else's story. Uh, in this case, the Russian Empire, but rather it needed to be studied on its own. And then you could worry about what happened afterwards when you got to those periods. Um, then you have the revolution, in which he loses almost complete influence and becomes almost a non-person as a scholar within the Soviet realm. But there were people, small bands of people who were still influenced by him, who kept sort of uh, what's the right word, maybe the, the torch alive outside of, of, of the Soviet Union, uh, particularly in the United States uh, and, and Canada and, and the United Kingdom. And, and as a result, there was sort of you know, almost an underground movement, although it was pretty above ground, of course, in, in America, um, to, to be faithful to that tradition because it was the right answer from a scholarly perspective, right? I mean, he had, he, he had gotten it right. Um, that needed to be pointed out again and again and again, but it wasn't really until the late 80s and now, with the, since 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that he really has finally succeeded because now nobody argues that the medieval Rus period should be, just, should be you know, its, its own period, should be studied for itself as the sources lay it out and not as part of something else. Um, and so in that sense, his impact was huge at the time, sort of then was a little bit muted and now has come back into its own. And we're now acknowledging through this translation project, but also the fact that scholars now quote him polemicize with them, argue with them, disagree, agree, etc. But he's now part of the dialectic. So after 100 years of, of, of being away from it, he's he's back from the center of, of yeah, bizarrely, uh, posthumously uh, at the center of loose studies.
I can't praise this project highly enough from the point of view of scholarship, um, but even more, I need to praise them because the only way to be true to Khrushchevsky's quality as a scholar would be to try to be as scholarly as he, to be as professional as he, as rigorous as he. And, and they've done it. I mean, the, the, all these, all three volumes that I have next to me right now, the first three volumes that I was involved in, um, are, are fantastic works. I mean, great translations, great editorial work, great scholarly uh, research went into it. Wonderful additions at the end. The, the additions to Khrushchevsky's notes are fantastic because they bring a lot of, you know, updating a lot of scholarship from his own bibliographies. So as, as a work of scholarship, this is first rate. I mean, not, not just Khrushchevsky, who was always first rate. Purely from the point of view of scholarship, I mean, Khrushchevsky's content speaks for itself. The project didn't have to have those standards. You know, it took a long time to produce these volumes because they decided to be rigorous in how they honored his uh, his work, and they've done it. It's a great it's a great monument to, to, to Khrushchevsky, but it's also a great contribution to the field because you now have in one place a chance to point at people who re who do not read U Ukrainian or don't have the time to to you know go through you know like frankly you know, through thousands of pages of material. You can now you know, point them and say, okay, here you know here read this you get a good, you know, your first good understanding of the history of the period. It'd be a real disservice if, if people tried to use Khrushchevsky from a nationalistic or chauvinistic perspective, because he was not that. He was a national historian, he was not a nationalist historian, if you understand the difference. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's an important distinction. Um, he wanted to honor the history of Russia and honor the history of Belarus and honor the history of Ukraine by saying, let's actually, you know, let's look at, the, at their histories as they developed, as the sources tell us. Um, he would be very impatient with anybody trying to use history to claim this or that in the modern period, because that's what he was trying to prevent, which was a modern filter over the past. What he wanted to say was, let the past speak for itself, and then we can see where it leads, rather than say we should use, the, use history to make a particular point in the past. Um, I, I certainly don't like the way that uh, history has been weaponized in, in, under in Putin's Russia. Don't agree with it as a scholar, don't agree with it as an American. Um, uh, at the same time, I don't think we should stoop to that level and try to engage in a tit for tat. One, that's not the way the sources would, would have us uh, uh, come at the problem. Certainly not honor Khrushchevsky's uh, memory as a scholar. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk about the work of people at the Yatsik Center and others in, in the Ukrainian diaspora in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s in, in helping us really rigorously um, in, embolden and empower Ukrainian scholarship, that is scholarship on Ukraine and scholarship in Ukraine on Ukraine and, and related countries. Um, you know, they, they put their money where their, where their uh, ideals were. Um, a, a lot of the work that was done at, 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 at Harvard and in Toronto and other places in Canada, they kept the flame alive. And that took organization, that took commitment, that took patience, that took determination, and it took money. And so, you know, when you look at this volume, you know, you look at this, okay, well, it's a 10 volume set, but behind it, it's, it's like tip of an iceberg of an enormous community of people who are committed to, to a particular worthy cause and, and frankly, have, have have seen it to to fruition. And I don't think I look at the I look at the explosion of scholarship now in modern Ukraine. In, I mean, in Ukraine, um, how they've been freed and so this enormous explosion of of, of, of of literary analysis and archaeological work. It's, that's all made possible because of the work that was done in the diaspora. I mean, Sergei Plohi. I was at Harvard when he first went there. I think uh, back in the mid '80s, and 40 years later, he's you know, the other. Krushevsky chair, he acts as that bridge. It's a good example of, you know, the way that behind the scenes, people were actively organizing and ready for a time that they knew what happened eventually. And when it came, they were ready. So, um, you know, my hats are off to the Yatsik Center and to everybody else in this project because of what they did, but also what they represent on behalf of others who did it too.